So we, we've been asked to to give you a, a talk about seasonal commissioning, but I, I thought I'd just kind of start. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the image on the on the left of the screen. Um, it was the it was the prototype uh, for the mini, which obviously made it into production on the right hand side. Um, and one of the things that I think we we always need to be aware of, and indeed we need to explain to our 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 clients, is that we are to a certain extent in the construction industry, in the business of developing prototypes. Um, we don't mass produce stuff much. I mean, you do if potentially if you're in the housing market, but generally speaking, each building that we build is, is individual. Um, and as a consequence, we don't really go into production per se, because production in, or, of uh, standard products of this nature assume vast um, uh, time is associated with testing uh, and correcting and updating and upgrading the ideas to go from prototype to production, which in the construction industry, we, we don't really do. So do you want to move on? Um, this is a, a slide. Um, it's a photograph I took um, back in 2010, actually. If some of you may recall, um, there was a, a volcano called, I don't even remember what it was called. I can't even pronounce it. But essentially, it closed down the airspace in Europe. Um, and it just happened that I, I happened to be um, uh, at Gathwick for some reason, I don't remember why. And I took a photograph of this, of this uh, departure lounge, uh, departure board. And, and the reason I, I show it is that when we, when we commission buildings um, leading up to practical completion, um, we commission them in a situation that the building is unlikely ever to see again. In other words, we commission them empty. This is representative of the fact that, that airports very rarely see this. In fact, I, I, was, I was never expecting to see this sort of image again, sadly with COVID, perhaps that, that we could, I could have taken a photograph like this again. But my point is that they will never ever be, buildings will never be in this stage again, this, this state where they're empty. And that's what happens when you try to uh, commission a building going up to practical completion. Next one, Zoe. Um, so really what the conversation today or the, the discussion the presentation today was all to do with, with seasonal commissioning and we're going to use the Beecroft building as an example. Nick. Thank you Roger. Yeah so um, I'll just start off with giving a bit of background to the Beecroft to set the scene for um, seasonal commissioning. Uh, so Beecroft building, um, we did do a tour of it actually um, um, once it was completed and some of you might have come on that tour so hopefully you know a bit about building um, but essentially it's kind of split into two so you've got um, the, the above ground part is uh, offices the theoretical physics essentially office space and um, the below ground basement levels are um, the experimental physics laboratories and there's two levels of, sort of walk-in interstitial service zones that sit above the laboratory levels for the distribution of services um, so in the in the basement levels um, we've got the laboratories and the, the the majority of the laboratories in this building are laser laboratories. So there's 20 on in total, 10 on B1 and 10 on basement two. And the main thing the department are doing in these laboratories is uh, developing quantum computers. And to do that, they needed um, very close control of the environment. So uh, we had um, the design brief was uh, temperature control to 0.5 degrees C in the room itself and 0.1 degrees C in the enclosure. Uh, we had humidity um, requirements at 50% relative humidity, plus or minus 10. And um, there was just a point to note that, you know, we would expect to see a year round cooling load in this building because there's a lab equipment in the basement um, generating heat all year round. Um, <coughs> offices were not, you know, just sort of quite a traditional office design, really. Um, mechanically ventilated from a central system. Um, there was some cooling provided through the ventilation system in the, in the form of a cooling coil in the AHU that cools down the fresh air. But it, it wasn't a comfort cooled like uh, you might get from a sort of design comfort cooling DX system, something like that. It was more just uh, to prevent overheating, to uh, you know assist the ventilation and maintain um, acceptable peak temperatures rather than give a, a designed temperature. Um, the heating was provided by radiators with TRVs on a sort of classic low temperature hot water system. Um, openable windows were provided for the 
for the users to operate. Um, and we, we had some contacts in those windows so that if the window was open, the mechanical ventilation would shut down. And we also had the ventilation system arranged with present detectors. So if the room was unoccupied for a period of time, again, the ventilation would, would shut down. It's just a sort of uh, energy saving feature. So if we move on to the general heating and cooling strategy of the building, uh, we had um, the whole building had the same system. So labs, offices, the whole building, we just had one sort of heating and cooling system. So we had ground source heat pump was the lead system, most energy efficient system. And this was actually a simultaneous heating and cooling system. So it can provide heating or cooling at the same time. And, and when it has a load of both, it can actually take waste heat from um, the building on the cooling side and put that into the heating side. So it's quite energy efficient. Um, but we were limited on how big a ground source heat pump we could provide by the footprint of the building and the fact we already had basement anyway. So we were already um, about 16 meters down. So that we limited on how much output we could get from the ground source heat pump. We also had a CHP, which at the time of design was considered uh, a, you know, an energy efficient, renewable way of generating heat and electricity. Um, that again, that was limited on how much we could, we could heating and we could get from that. And so we had boilers uh, provided also, which were sized to do the full heating load of the building um, and accounting for a scenario where the ground source heat pump or the CHP might have failed so that we had that full resilience. Uh, and we also had chillers on the roof, again, sized to the full cooling load, peak summer cooling load, um, again, in case the ground source heat pump was unavailable because of the research is so critical, we didn't want um, you know, the building to be to be compromised in any way. Move on to the next slide. Uh, we're just going to touch on uh, soft landings, which we, we did on this project. Um, and so this is the um, Bisria sort of soft landings map, which, which as you can see, uh, sets out what you should do at each um, design stage. And, uh, you know, it's never too early to start on soft landings, really. They, you, they've even got activities there for um, stage zero and stage one of what you should be doing in the spirit of soft landings at those early stages. Um, on this project, Oxford University actually have their own um, soft landing strategy, which you can sort of see an image of on the right, which they've developed, which is not exactly the same as the Bisria, but is basically trying to achieve the same thing and has a lot of crossover. Um, one of the key things I would say we did on this project is that we, were, we held fortnightly meetings with the facilities team that were going to be um, operating the building once it was complete. And we would, we would literally go through uh, a system by system, week by week, pick a different system, fire alarm one week, heating one week, cooling the other week, and just talk through the system so that the facilities team uh, understood the system and had a clear vision of it before they moved into the building. and. Um, so, you know, they, they already knew what they were they were getting, um, which I think was really successful. And we, I think we got David Sharp from the department on the call. I don't know if you just want to mention if you found that useful, David. Hi, you can hear me now? Yes. OK, good. Yeah, no, I, I thought that the well, I didn't know quite what soft landings was. I've not been involved in this sort of project before, but um, uh, and and when the we had a sort of soft landings launch, that actually happened part way through these facilities meetings that had already started, um, and and it, it proved that those facilities meetings were you know I think the the you know the the, the keystone of, um, of 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 us understanding the building. It was a fantastic way to understand the building. Actually, partly during some of the design development stages as well. So. Uh, there was there was feedback from the department team and from the University of States team back in the project, and it was uh, yeah it was it was really a, a fantastic way to get to know the building before you know a couple of years before we were heading into it. Thank you. Um, so part of the what we part of what we did in during the soft landings period and to inform seasonal commissioning is we um, did a TM54 analysis, which some of you might have heard of. It's uh, TM54 is Technical Memorandum 54, which is a SIBZ document, um, which basically covers uh, how to evaluate operational energy, um, which looks at um, unregulated energy as well as regulated energy. So um, regulated energy is what you assess as part of your part L, 
calculations and that looks at what energy the building is going to be using if it was empty uh, essentially so it looks at uh, the heating cooling ventilation lighting but not any of the actual energy that the users are using so it doesn't really give you a picture of what the building's actually going to consume so the tm54 attempts to do that so what what you do is you basically the process is you sit down with the people that are going to use the building you ask them loads of questions how are you going to use it when you're going to come in what what equipment are you going to use when are you going to use it and you put all of that information into this um into this uh, model and you you get a picture of what the building is actually going to be consuming once it's up and running. And, and that's a really useful tool to use as part of your seasonal commissioning, because then when you get measured data six months later, you can compare that against your TM54 and say, are we using more than we predicted? Are we using less than we predicted? And why are we using more or less than we predicted? And that allows you to then fine tune the building to, to get the best out of it. Um, so yeah, that was what we did on this project. And, um, that's that's the, the basis of the TM54. So then on to seasonal commissioning for the Beefrock project. Um, as Nick said, we use the TM54 assessment to gauge to estimate energy consumption. This graph shows the estimated gas consumption um, along with the actual CHP gas consumption and the boiler gas consumption. Um, as with all things, it's important to remember the context is key. So from February onwards, you might think, God, we really were doing great. We're using so little gas and climate change has solved. Um, in reality, though, there, there were a lot of issues going on with the buildings. So you can see in November, the CHP stopped uh, using any gas. That's because it actually exploded a bit. And um, as a result, the boiler gas consum consumption skyrockets because it had to pick up the heating load. Um, so perhaps what might be more insightful to do is look at what the TM54 would have predicted if we had known the CHP was going to fail. And this graph estimates that. So you can see actually in November and December, we weren't doing too well at all. Um, and that points to the fact that there might be another issue going on in the building. Um, and again, contextually, we can see in February, in January, maybe February, something changes dramatically and gas consumption begins to decrease a lot. So, well, what was going on? Uh, in, it turned out to be the third prong to the heating strategy, the ground source heat pump system. So this graph here shows uh, how much each of the three were expected to contribute to heating, and then similarly, how much they actually contributed. Again, you can see the CHP just, just drops off a cliff, um, but it's a bit harder to make out, but you might be able to tell the ground source actually doesn't contribute anywhere near as much as we anticipated. And similarly, from November onwards, the boilers contribute, contribute a lot. Um, what happened here is the control strategy was using a temperature sensor that failed uh, for the ground source system anyway. So the ground source thought that there wasn't a whole lot of heating demand, so it wasn't picking it up. The boilers were using a different temperature sensor, so they realized that there was heating demand, and as a result, we're picking that up. Um, the boilers, of course, of course, used gas and were less efficient in that way. Um, so it wasn't an ideal situation. But without seasonal commissioning, it's unlikely that this would have been picked up and the building might still be operating inefficiently. Um, another aspect to seasonal commission that we should look at is the ventilation strategy. So I'm sure we can all imagine from mid-April onwards what happened was because of COVID-19, the, the office AGU had to ramp up a lot to provide more fresh air to occupants. And this, of course, had a knock-on effect on energy consumption in the building. This AHU actually began to uh, use 25% more electricity because of this change. But the key to seasonal commissioning is that it isn't just about uh, energy consumption. You also have to make sure that the building um, operates well and meets all of the, building, all of the occupant requirements throughout the year, even if that year contains a pandemic. So on to lessons learned. Um, about six months into occupancy, we did an occup a post-occupancy evaluation of the building. Uh, these are cherry-picked responses. It wasn't all about the ventilation strategy. There were things like we want more microwaves, but these are the most relevant here. Uh, I think there are three issues here. The first um, is let's address the bottom response there. The ventilation is terrible and we have to open the windows. As Nick mentioned at the beginning, the ventilation strategy was that uh, if you open the windows, the ventilation shuts off. 
it's unclear here if the occupants actually know that, if they realise that by opening the windows, they're really reducing what we can do for them. Um, the second issue is that they, well, they think ventilation is terrible in general. Um, Nick mentioned, of course, that the ventilation in rooms was based on occupancy. So if the sensors detected that no one was there, it would shut off. This was a relatively easy fix, really. Instead of doing that, we just ramped it back. There was no occupancy. So when they returned, um, the conditions were better. And finally, the third issue is that they think there's air conditioning. Nick mentioned again, of course, that there isn't. There was just tempering, really. Um, we can't do a whole lot with a system that doesn't exist, that isn't installed. So here we really should have um, managed expe expectations. Um, because if the bar is set so high that we can't get it, that we can't meet it, um, there's not a whole lot we can do in seasonal commissioning. So, as I mentioned, one of the key issues that cropped up was that the ground source wasn't contributing as much as we expected to heating. Uh, we really need to trust the data that we're receiving. So if we'd known that that temperature sensor was less reliable than others, we could have um, adopted the controlled strategy before it was installed. Instead, we had to deal with it on the fly and uh, wasted some energy as a result. This graph just informs the next one really, but the key thing to remember is that boiler efficiency really drops at low loads. Um, and this graph shows the total B crop heating for about six months or so. So as you can see on the right there, the heating tends to be at quite a low level. Um, you may remember the boilers were each 500 kilowatts. So we're really below the total capacity there. Um, this meant that they tended to operate at really low efficiencies. This though is far from a, an issue need to be cropped. Really, we see it in virtually every seasonal commissioning project that we work on, be it a retail heating scheme, um, cooling systems in the university building. Uh, it's not unique again to heat and cooling. We see it in domestic hot water systems, electrical systems. It really is rampant throughout the industry. Uh, an internal case study that we did looked at this and said that based on that one case study, we think if you used a less conservative design approach, <laughs> sorry, um, you may save about 11% on boiler cost, 9% on footprint, and the boiler capacity would be about half that otherwise. There would, of course, be other savings um, to do with smaller pumps using less gas, etc. So the key lesson that we need to learn here is that we need to actually learn these lessons. We need to take the ones that we're learning in this project and use it in the next. So I guess this is where I take over. Um, uh, so, so if you want to go to the next slide, this is really just uh, uh, thinking more broadly about uh, how uh, the, the seasonal commissioning process can, it, can inform and, and help guide uh, the, the the brief. Um, one of the things that I think is important to consider is, is the design conditions uh, that we use when we're, when we're looking at buildings. Um, and specifically, and, and it is with something that, that came out with Beecroft, we've also seen it with other buildings, um, where for, for, for many reasons, it, it, is, um, it, it is quite possible that we, we don't design a building to um, to operate sort of satisfactorily under certain design conditions. So, for example, <clears throat> quite often we will design to a 99% uh, weather condition um, because you have to constrain the, uh, the, the, the designs in some way, shape or form. Um, and I think what's, what becomes important in that regard is some of the design decisions that are made early on in the process um, becomes uh, kind of Im important. Um, to consider, but more importantly, it, it's important that those decisions are then um, uh, communicated appropriately to the people who use the use the building. So, in the in the case of Beecroft, um, th there was no, as it were, air conditioning of of the office space. There was ventilation and there was heating. Um, so, for people to complain about the fact there was no air conditioning, well, that's because there was a design decision made, um, such as there wasn't any such um, air conditioning. One of the things that I think is, is interesting is how we as an industry better um, inform the users of the buildings. Um, there's always a, a building user guide. Building user guide are, are, are quite regularly um, large PDF documents which are 
um, filed away, never to see the light of day. And I think that there are, and certainly some of the work we've done um, uh, for the bank building and also some other buildings where you actually try to present the data about how the building is designed and how it can be used in a much, much easily absorbed format. So whether you, you show it on TV screens in the, in the foyer, which says something like, you know, you don't have air conditioning. So, you know, you've got to open the windows in order for uh, the system to work. Bear in mind, if you do that, then we're going to turn the ventilation off. Um, so just explaining to people how the building is designed, I think, I think um, uh, really helps. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Zoe. Um, there's, there was an interesting Bizria guide, a uh, Bizria study done into, into oversized plan. Um, and it, it identified that, that Emily uh, consultants regularly, um, over, well, the, the design team regularly oversize equipment. And, and of course, part of the reason for doing that is, is that um, I don't think anybody has ever been sued for oversizing plant. There is a, clearly a risk, adverseness, a risk adverseness associated with design teams um, because it's kind of easier just to put in a slightly bigger boiler because relatively speaking, the cost implications um, aren't, aren't that important than the marginal costs. Um, but what that does mean is that systems won't necessarily operate very well during what you might consider the, or the, the normal operating conditions. And as we saw in some of the slides that Zoe was showing, is that the normal operating conditions for heating, for example, the, the peak load might be uh, a, a, a megawatt, but actually you're generally working down in the hundreds of kilowatts most of the time. And as a consequence, um, the, the, the system may well be designed to operate really efficiently at 100% output, but that's not how it, how it operates. Um, if you go to the next slide, the the, 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 the real problem with it with oversizing plant is that is that if you if you try to um, reduce the plant size, the, it's the design team who are taking the risk, and it's the client who's getting the reward. And therefore, as a consequence, there is always this this um, this clash associated with well, well the, the the design team will want to make it slightly bigger because they just don't want to take on the risk. And as a consequence, the the, the design brief needs to have so the intelligent conversations with the client, which says that we, we might be able to reduce the capital cost of your building by reducing the size of the chill or reducing the size of the boilers or, or whatever it might be from an ME standpoint. But, but bear in mind that there is a risk that possibly there might be conditions where the building might be a bit cold or the building might be a bit hot. Um, but there is a capital benefit to you um, as long as you don't sue us afterwards for undersizing the plant. And I think that's one of the one of the fundamental challenges we have as an industry is to is to how you get that balance right, and that can only happen from an informed conversation with the client, um, backed up by um, operational data from buildings such as Beecroft or other buildings where we actually know what the what the reality was. If you move on to the next slide, please. The other, the other thing about um, uh, about this process. Um, about designing the, 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 or testing the design brief is, is having put in place at the start of the program some idea about, about a data strategy. And, and this is all to do with when you've built the building, what will you want to know about the building um, to be able to improve its performance? That's what the seasonal commissioning process is all about, it's improving the performance. And what you really don't want to do is you don't want to get into the, the scenario, if you go to the next slide, um, which is the Donald Rumsfeld. For those of you who know Donald Rumsfeld, you'll be aware of, of his sort of classic quote, which is the, the known knowns uh, argument. And, I, and I've always maintained that you don't want to get to the end of the project and know a whole bunch of stuff that you don't know. And particularly when you say, if only I knew that, we would be able to do this. Um, so one, one good example, I think, of that, which uh, comes out of some of the projects we've done, is, is occupancy data. Um, uh, people quite often say, well, we, we know how many people are in the building because we have, we have access control. Uh, actually, you don't know how many people are in the building with access control. You simply know how many people have entered the building. You have no idea how many people who have left the building. And so therefore, having, having gone through the process at the start of the project to understand what data you're going to want to be able to inform and improve the performance of the building is, is key. If we go to the next slide. So just, just looking uh, to the future and, and seasonal commissioning, 
Um, if you go on to the next slide, one of the things that, that I think is important about, about seasonal commissioning um, is this understanding that when you give someone a, a new building uh, or, as it were, a new toy, they are likely to, um, to reconsider how they're going to use that building because it might well be that the design a brief that was, was developed five years previously when, it was, when the design brief was done, um, it was done on the basis of, of a building that, that those occupants were already occupying and therefore their, their, their views will have been in, informed but perhaps also constrained by the building they already had. And we, and we see uh, regularly um, with season, the seasonal commission process and, and post-occupancy evaluation, it is people going, oh, well, had I, had I sort of realized that this is what the building was going to look like or how it was going to feel, then I would have thought about these other things. Um, and so, so you've, got, you've got the idea that the client's going to change their mind about how they're going to use the space. And also, you're also going to see um, uh, changes um, in usage patterns. So, for example, and, and I think COVID is a very good example of this, where suddenly the, the, something that we couldn't have predicted is going to mean that the building is going to need to change in the way it operates. And the whole part of the process of, of seasonal commissioning is to ensure that the building is providing the environment and space for those occupants to be productive. And, and it's, it is the occupants who are likely to change their minds. And the seasonal commissioning process has to, has to work with that to try to get them the, the, the best building they can, even if that means that it's not really quite what the original design brief was. I do think that seasonal commissioning does have a have a, a, a danger, which is that people think of it as being only seasonal. Um, that tends to mean that some buildings simply have four visits a year where um, the, the team turn up in the summer sometime um, and, and review the operation of the building there and then. Um, I think a better way of describing seasonal commissioning is more to consider it as being continuous commissioning. Because what you need to look at, you need to look at the data flows from the building to evaluate how the building has performed over a period of time. If you simply wait for the, the date you've got in the summer to turn up and do the, the summer seasonal commissioning bit, you may well turn up on a day where it's pouring with rain and actually it's not represented in the summer at all. So therefore that the seasonal bit, it, it becomes problematic from that standpoint. If we go on to the next page, the, the other thing I think also we, we need to be aware of is of course is that the, the, there will be a change in the focus of what is deemed to be a, a, a well-performing building. Clearly, you want the building to be providing the environment in which it is conducive for those occupants to do whatever it is they are meant to be doing and being productive in, in that regard. So in the case of, of Beecroft, it's, it's all to do with, uh, with um, uh, research, um, developing papers and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what makes the productive building. But one of the things I just want to throw up this, this slide, which just really um, points people to, to the, the, the idea that in the future, what, what is defined as being a well-performing building, carbon is going to be a really key aspect of that. Um, and it's worth noting, of course, that the thing about carbon is it's changing all the time. The carbon intensity of the grid is changing all the time. So one of the things that we will, be, we will need to look at from a continuous commissioning standpoint is, is the impact on carbon emissions associated with the building. If we go on to the next slide, please, Zoe. Um, just, this is just, a, again, a thought, going back to the idea about the, the data strategy and making sure that uh, um, you, you get the right data and at the, at the point where you're developing the data strategy, one needs to recognize that the data in its own right is useless. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros. To a certain extent, information also isn't necessarily helpful. Um, the, the image in the middle is, is taken from uh, a building that I've worked in a lot and is the, is the uh, I think it's the, the, the PV panel, which is uh, proudly uh, in the reception of the building and quite frankly, is completely and utterly useless because it gives you no sense whatsoever of is that, is that a good thing or is it bad? Have we done well or have we done badly? There's no, there's no contextual information. What you really need is you need to turn data into information and then perform that into action. And, and it's all about having actual information uh, derived from the data. If you're just having data to data, say it's kind of slightly pointless. Move on to the next slide. 
Um, the, the key thing there actually is that is that in order for data to be useful, you've, it's got to be trustworthy. Um, and one of the things that seasonal commissioning does tend to pick up is that actually we as an industry do a really, really bad job, generally speaking, of commissioning the monitoring systems and the metering systems that we put in place. And, and the kind of key lesson there is that you have to have someone within the construction project program or, or perhaps within the client team who, who actually cares about that data um, and it is, is therefore going to be refusing as it were to accept the building until those data systems and those metering systems are actually operating and are providing reliable information. If we go on to the next slide, the other thing which I think also is going to be coming more to the fore for kind of commissioning in the future is the idea that we start to commission by exception. And, and the, the, the idea here is that we can write rules um, and, um, and algorithms which determine whether or not a system is performing well. Generally speaking, commissioning is done as and uh, typical for, for consulting engineers. We will go and evaluate 10% you know, of the system, and that's how we, we define what we need to review and, and, and witness in terms of commissioning. What we can actually do nowadays is, is that we can identify, and I'll give you a very simple example. We can identify which temperature sensors are, are working or not. And you can do that simply by defining some pretty, pretty simple guidelines. If there's a temperature sensor in, a, in an occupied space, the chances are that it's probably going to be somewhere between, let's say, 16 and 25 degrees C. If it's outside of those values, it's probably not right. And so therefore, we can identify those where we, they lie outside of the expected values. And then we can focus our commissioning efforts on the bits which aren't working, rather than a, a blanket view. The, the other benefit of this process is that if you feed all of your commissioning data into uh, your, your building model, or indeed into your building management system, it, it allows you to set a, a, a baseline. And that baseline can then be used in the future to determine whether or not the efficiency of certain systems is in any way degrading or, or and therefore as a consequence whether there's something you need to do about it. Generally speaking, commissioning data is written down and, and put in the, in the manuals. Um, it would be much more useful if that was, as it were, a, a, a part of the data stream that you use when you are evaluating and, and commissioning uh, the building. Um, that's kind of the end of the presentation. What I was going to leave you with really is, um, we, sorry, just go back to that previous slide, Zoe. That, that's what we've kind of tried to talk to you about. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I wanted to just leave you with this quote, which I think, again, is, is really useful. Uh, seasonal commissioning is all about reality, uh, whereas design is about uh, assumptions and compliance calculations, so, so forth. If we want to get buildings to work well, we actually need to know how they operate. And, and one of the things I would really encourage um, the construction industry to do, if I can leave you with just one thought, is if you've been involved in, in designing and developing a building, for heaven's sake, go back and visit it. Because that's only the, that's the way you find out whether the ideas that you had during the construction process actually worked. Thanks so much. Over to you, Emma. Thank you to you three. That was really, really interesting. I, there's obviously no questions during that. Has anyone got any questions that they want to raise now? Then pop them in the chat. Um, if I just mention quickly that, uh, well, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got a networking breakfast on the 26th and a webinar from ICB waterproofing on the 10th of March. If anyone has any ideas of things they'd like to see us present or if they have anything that they'd like to present to the CE committee, um, then let me know um, because we're always open to new things and I think everyone welcomes these webinars as uh, something to look forward to. Um, I guess there's no questions, so I'll wrap that up there. Thank you, uh, Zoe, Nick and Roger. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>